Chapter 29, The Show. Tony was walking back to their room. The show was going to start when the sun went down. Hey, that's kind of early, but that's kind of a cool idea, Tony thought. Walking through the tunnels, there were groups of gorillas. Beer time. All right. <clears throat> Walking through the tunnels, there were groups of gorillas, excitedly laughing, wearing makeup and rock clothes. Other groups of mixed primates laughed and told stories, drinking monkey juice, while others ran by. Is this recording? Hello? Are you recording? Okay. There was something in the air. It felt like outside of the venue of before an awesome rock show. The hallways were like a parking lot tailgating party. One group of apes he passed reminded him of a group from Heavy Metal Parking Lot, the movie. Tony loved that movie. Tony L. and Perry had watched that movie many times. Kind of like a rock and roll fan bible. Every heavy metal fan should watch it. It's fucking hilarious. He got back to their room, and the pre-party was in full swing. Everyone was there. Elle was with her new best friend, Janice. Perry, his clone, and his pregnant girlfriend. His pregnant girlfriend was bending over... Oh, shit. His pregnant girlfriend bending over, showing her ass to everyone. They had a big bucket of monkey juice in the middle of the room. Tony didn't know how it got there, and they cheered as Tony entered and gave him a glass. The party was on. They drank, laughed, told stories, and were generally just getting excited and hyped up for the show. Perry, Tony, and Elle were in their element in this pre-concert atmosphere, even though they were living in a crazy sci-fi world and hanging out with talking apes and monkeys. <clears throat> There's something about going to a heavy metal show that brings people together, not only physically, but mentally also. Everyone gathers at a certain place, all with the same intentions of having a good time, to have fun because they all enjoy the same music. Everyone knowing they will soon be crammed into a hot, small area, smashed together, and their favorite band will be playing their favorite music. <coughs> In human society, Perry, Tony, and Elle didn't go to violent metal shows where you try to hurt each other. The shows they went to were rowdy, but the type where if someone in the crowd falls down in the mosh pit, everyone stops to help that person up and then begins moshing again. They had a feeling the monkey rock shows were like that too. They partied in their guest room for about an hour. Every few minutes, someone would rush in looking for Janice. She had the latest batch of worms, so they were in the hottest room in the whole tribe. Elle explained to Tony that Janice was the alchemist. She made the worms for the whole tribe. So they were hanging out with So they were hanging out with the party queen. Tony had time to tell Perry about candy. And Perry got extremely excited when he heard she was looking for him. When Tony told Perry her name, he looked up dreamily into the sky and whispered with a big smile, Candy. Bob showed up and partied for a while, with some gamer chimps tagging along beside him. He pulled a massive joint out from his Rasta cap, lit it, and passed it around the room. Just about when everyone had too much monkey juice, someone... Someone rushed by the door and slapped it. Showtime! Showtime! They all started getting ready. Perry wasn't sure. He decided to take clone Perry. No, he didn't. That's bullshit. He decided to leave clone Perry and his pregnant girlfriend in the room to, uh, quote, watch their stuff. There was a small line at the door. It wasn't really a line since there wasn't tickets or security checking people. It was just a small traffic jam of monkeys, apes, 
And now a few humans squeezing in the mosh tree. Perry thought about hiding his drugs, but then remembered he didn't fucking need to in this society. Drugs were welcome. Walking in a mosh tree again was just as amazing, even though it was a completely different atmosphere this time. It was a little dark when they entered. The entrance hallway gave way to the open space of the arena. They all stopped to look around and take it all in. The ring where King fought Big Flea was the pit. The stage was built at the south side. They all liked that. They hated when the stage was in the center of the arena. It was almost at full capacity. Branch seats along the walls were filled with apes and monkeys. Beer time. Uh-oh. Ugh. That was a big beer. I just pounded. Got to pound a lot of beers for this chapter. It really felt like an arena before a human rock show. <coughs> Tony somehow doubted when the band came out it would have the same energy as a human rock show, but so far this was legit. <coughs> he heard the band practicing before the show and knew they were really good. He just wasn't sure it would translate, but they were about to find out. Someone tapped L on the shoulder and pointed behind them. King was waving them over. He had saved them some seats near him. <clears throat> of course, King had a great spot. On the right of the stage, right above the pit standing on the area. L was relieved. They all were actually. He wanted to see how crazy all these big ass gorillas got before be actually being in the mosh pit with them. They got up to King's spot and it was the best seat in the house. Right dangling right over the mosh pit. They could jump in if they wanted and a f only a few feet from the stage. They felt like VIPs. The lights dimmed a bit and the crowd reacted with a small cheer. As the lights dimmed, joints lit up everywhere. Some silhouettes appeared behind, behind the stage and the crowd's cheer got bigger. A smoke machine puffed, and a moment later, the band came out dark silhouettes. Axel was the first to walk out. He walked out slowly, confidently, looking down, one arm raised with one finger on one arm raised, like, number one, just held it up. He stopped walking and held up his hand. Les came next, holding his base by the neck upside down over his head. Whoa, the humans had never saw that before. Then Moon came out, doing cartwheels while juggling four drumsticks in the air, using all four limbs. Another impressive feat. The humans looked at each other. Oh shit, that's fucking sweet. They didn't say a word. Three dark silhouettes in a cloud of smoke on stage. Axel stood at the front of the stage, still looking down with one finger raised. The humans looked at each other. Damn, these guys had some stage presence already. You could feel it. The first guitar chord went off, and everyone in the arena recognized it, including the humans. It was the intro to Killing in the Name by Rage, the long strums of guitar before the bass comes in. The humans looked at each other in excitement. Someone pointed to the ceiling. There was Jimmy, being lowered in on a rope, holding his pick arm out soulfully after each strum, like he was Tom fucking Morello. Jimmy, the final member, landed on the stage and the crowd went crazy. Les took over the bass for a few seconds, then Moon hit those cowbells to finish the intro and the band kicked in its first groove of the night perfectly. That song has a rift at the beginning that kind of sounds like a siren, then a short build-up. Axel sat unmoving with his head looking down at the front of the stage until the perfect moment, and then with his whole body growled, KILLING IN THE NAME OF! Right when the super heavy, funky main riff came in, 
and the crowd erupted with metal madness. Boom! Every monkey, ape, and human in the place was dancing or headbanging and singing. Entire mosh tree was rocking back and forth. Then the song gets to the place where it slows and Zack kind of talks. Some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Axel was stomping the stage from left to right, looking intensely at the crowd, pointing and emphasizing every word like it was torturing him. L, Perry, and Tony had seen Rage Against the Machine live many times, and Axel seemed to be channeling Zack in his prime. The band was perfect. Beer time? Oh. I'll be by that. They got to the finale of the first song. Axel started whispering. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Over and over, building it up. The entire crowd was bouncing with him, anticipating the perfect ending to a Rage Against the Machine song. And then the crowd exploded in unison with the band. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. The entire mosh tree shook with the song. A chimp hanging from the roof by his tail let go and did a double backflip into the mosh pit. And many smaller monkeys floated on the crowd. A circle pit of mainly gorillas bounced in the center of the pit, stomping the ground, bouncing in the air as high as possible, singing and screaming in the air. Axel finished the song, drawing upon a deep, unseen anger and growled the final words, MOTHERFUCKER! and bared his teeth to the crowd. All three humans' hair was standing on the back of their necks. They looked at each other. Holy fuck, they all thought. That was intense, Tony yelled over the roaring crowd. L looked down into the pit and asked, Oh my God, are you guys going into the pit? Perry was like, No fucking way with all those motherfucking gorillas. Tony took a big drink of monkey juice. I might go down there. King smiled at them. You should. They won't hurt you. That bad. <laughs> he smiled bigger. The way their concerts worked was one hour of show followed by a 30 minute break. King said they planned to do three hour long sets with breaks in between. They played a set that consisted mostly of the greatest metal hits of the 90s and 2000s. Les sang back up. He had a high voice for a gorilla, but he nailed the backing vocals to all the songs. He sang with soul. After a few songs and a, f- and a few glasses of monkey juice, Tony motioned at King. King smiled and they barreled into the pit for a few rage songs. Tony had been in mosh pits with big dudes before, but never as big as a bunch of motherfucking gorillas. Some of the time in the pit, he couldn't even see the stage, which was actually pretty normal. While he bounced around, he ran into other members of the mosh pit and tried pushing them. It was like pushing on a hairy wall, but it didn't matter to him. He was having a blast being pushed around like a pinball. During a heavy Caius cover, Tony put his hands together and motioned to King, like, float me. He didn't think about the implications of having the silverback of a giant tribe of a thousand apes float him. But King put his hands low and interlocked his fingers. Tony stepped in enthusiastically and instantly was flying higher than he imagined he would be. He saw the stage descending below him. Axel looked up while he was singing. He saw the ceiling of Mosh Tree closing in, slowly down, and then stopping. A few monkeys hanging in the ceiling reached down to touch Tony, and they almost touched hands. Then he started falling down and began descending. His stomach dropped out like on a roller coaster. King threw him about 30 or 40 feet up. A circle pit of gorillas were below him. But he wasn't worried. He had this biggest smile on his face ever. Normally, falling from this height would be dangerous or deadly, but Tony didn't seem to care. Elle looked on from the crowd, and she looked scared for him. 
Tony Flash double devil horns to the entire pit as he fell. He landed softly in a pad of gorilla arms. Everyone cheered. Next, they played a rare Praxis song. Worship. Tony and L couldn't even believe they knew this song. No one knew this song. It's an awesome song about how terrible religion can be. Perry loved it also for that reason. They all did, actually. Jimmy put a KFC bucket on his head for that song, a tribute to the great Praxis guitarist, Buckethead. They ended the first hour set with an amazing metal version of John Lennon's Imagine. The intermission started. Although it really wasn't an intermission between sets, it was more like a 30 minute break for the band to rest and party with the crowd. The band didn't go backstage to some secret room where the women had to give blowjobs to get in. There was no security. There was no green room. During the break, the band sat on stage, jumped into the crowd and partied with the friends, and basically just hung out. Moon stayed behind his drums and let the fan blow on his sweaty baboon ass. <clears throat> People came on stage and gave their praises. The concert switched to party mode for 30 minutes. L was talking with Perry. This sort of break would never go over well in human society. Perry agreed. Yep, some asshole would probably steal shit off the stage or something. L continued. Some whores would probably want the band to themselves and probably make a bunch of guys fight about it. Perry concluded, yeah, this is the best. He looked around at the giant party around him. Humans suck. A great 30-minute party ensued. And this refueled the band and the crowd. And soon, that powerful energy that a great rock show was about to happen, that feeling was back again. Then the band took the stage and started the second set. Beer time. The second set started with clutches, prophets of doom. A fitting song for the world they lived in, with war stores ravaging the earth, leveling cities. The prophets the Elosa Corporation were making were certainly being used for doom-like activities. Swallower of planets! Those lyrics never seem to ring more true. Prophets were swallowing the planet these humans lived on. The apes and monkeys all felt this too, as they were serving on the front line. They were actually fighting the war stores for their own freedom. Little did the humans on the other side of the fence know that there were a bunch of clone monkeys fighting against the war stores from the inside. But a lot of the humans probably didn't fucking care. This monkey and ape tribe was pretty much fighting to save the planet from a monster that the humans created. And that monster could also be summed up with the title Prophets of Doom. They rocked for another hour. They played Stone the Crow by Down. And although Tony thought he shouldn't go into the mosh pit with all those gorillas again, he went anyways. The music pulled him in. He looked back at Elle. He was going to tell her, I'll be right back. But then she jumped with him and she said, let's go. They both stayed down in the pit for enough songs to be covered in sweat and totally out of breath. The end of the second set concluded with the most epic version of Mr. Bungle's Retro Vertigo ever. The song starts out mellow. It kind of sounds like a Mother Goose fairy tale or a nursery rhyme. Retro Vertigo also has lyrics that amazingly describe the plight of humans in this time and these monkeys. About consumerism, it's insane. Retro Vertigo is a timeless song, like any great song. The song went on. Axel was singing. 
Sail the ride to your blight. Tony remembered having to look up the word blight to know what that line meant. He thought about those maniac ads who covered their bodies with advertisements. For sure, they sold the right to their blight. Axel kept singing. Now I'm finding truth is a ruin. Nauseous and that nobody is pursuing. Perry loved that line and sang it with his soul as loud as he could. Truth is a ruin, nauseous end that nobody is pursuing. The whole arena sang that lyric. Axel continued singing, doing his best Mike Patton impression. Staring into glassy eyes. Mesmerized. El remembered the look on the zombie like ads, infected with ICs, looking right past her with their glassy eyes, totally mesmerized. For some reason, all these songs were relating to memories of the insane consumer driven society that humans created. Retro Vertigo wasn't the fastest song in the world, but it was motherfucking heavy. Heavy as fuck right then and there with the lyrics with the lyrics describing what they were going through. Tony wished the real band Mr. Bungle was here to see this because he'd seen Mr. Bungle sing this live and he knew that they would have been impressed with this cover. So many different lines of that song were ringing true to each of the humans individually. The song ends fading out into silence, and the entire arena was silent at the end. Then Axel held up his mic and the place exploded, roaring with cheers. The second set was gnarlier than the first, if that was possible. During the second break, they partied more. They were all tired and didn't think they could handle raging for another hour. These hour sets with 30 minute breaks were really a great idea and it was perfect. In front of them, a gorilla with pink eyeshadow walked by. Tony remembered her from earlier and nudged at Perry. But Perry already saw and nudged back. I know, oh shit. Candy made her way to the row and scooted by people. Perry welcomed her and made a space. Well, hello, he said enthusiastically. Hi, handsome. Remember me, she said, scooting down next to him. Of course I remember you. How could I forget? Amazing show so far, huh? Candy asked. Oh my god, yes, Perry replied. And he leaned into her and said something into her ears. He was super close. He may have kissed her cheek. Tony looked over at Elle like, "Uh uh-oh. Elle shook her head. The third and final set started surprisingly with Brick House by the Commodores. And then they went right into Super Freak by Rick James. They were bringing the funk in the third set, it seemed. While everyone was standing up, grooving out to Super Freak, Candy started dancing with her ass to Perry, grinding on him like she was a Super Freak. Perry didn't think twice and was dancing in the moment and grabbing at her furry butt and hips. She seemed to like it when he grabbed her fur, and he used it to hold her while he danced. Candy was a good dancer. In the groove, her motions completely in tune with Perry's. Her ass was warm, and she rubbed up against Perry's crotch. Perry started to get aroused. She looked back at him with a warm, sexy smile. She reached back and felt his slight arousal, then made a Oh, look what I found, face, as she grabbed it. 
She stroked him for a moment with those long gorilla fingers. He had never felt anything like that before. He went from aroused to beyond hard. She pushed his body back with hers, forcing him back into the seat. He fell into his seat with a plop. He was a bit nervous and he looked to both sides, but everyone was rocking out dancing. Perry was more enthusiastic than nervous, obviously. She took a step towards him, turned around in front of him, and bent into a better position. She reached for his zipper and attempted once to unzip it unsuccessfully. Then in one motion, she ripped the front of his pants off. <laughs> Perry was like, whoa! He looked around again and thought that was super hot. She looked back at him again. This time, her face said, oops, I ripped your pants off. She lowered herself a bit and lowered her ass even more. She hovered right above his lap. He felt her heat. For a long moment, she looked at him, then lowered herself onto him. It was hot and she was strong. She went all the way down in one motion and took him in effortlessly. He jerked in his seat. It was amazing and weird. He tried not to come or he would have. She looked back and closed her eyes in pleasure. She smiled as she began to have sex with him. He reacted and grabbed at her hips, pulled on her fur, and he reached around to feel for her breasts. The skin was a little rough, but they were breasts. She got excited and squeezed him inside her. She kept it slow for a bit and then unleashed a fury of extremely fast pumping. It was like nothing he had ever felt. And Perry was a pervert who had seen the entirety of porn of the internet. She was fucking him faster than any human could, man or woman. Within a few seconds, he came, harder than he ever came before. He shuddered and moaned uncontrollably and jiggled in his seat. For a second, he was completely out of his mind and forgot where he was. He wrapped his arms around her without thinking. A wave of warmth washed over his body. Perry was in motherfucking love. A few seconds later, Perry came back to reality and looked around. No one even noticed. She just fucked him in the middle of this metal concert. The band just finished Super Freak and he stood up. Now, he was a super freak of his own. He kissed her cheek and reached for the glass of monkey juice. The third set was just as amazing as the first two. They injected some funk into the third set with some Bootsy Collins, Cool in the Gang. Every funk song tinged with at least a little bit of heavy metal. They played Cool in the Gang's Misled. Tony was like, I love that song, but that's like a rare Cool in the Gang song. One of his favorites, but not a greatest hit or anything like that. And Tony always thought it would make a good funk metal song. And it did. <clears throat> After that, they switched back to metal with an epic 16-minute cover of Stone Jesus's I Am The Mountain. Including the first, second, and third hour-long sets, the entire set consisted of something like this. Not in order or anything, but War Pigs by Black Sabbath, Waffle and Black by Seven Dust, Dopes to Infinity and Space Lord by Monster Magnet, many songs, maybe the whole first Rage Against the Machine album, 46 and 2 and Eulogy from Tool, Zombie Eaters, Surprise, You're Dead, Black Friday, and Jizzlobber from Faith No More, Guns and Roses songs, Welcome to the Jungle, Mr. Brownstone, Night Train, and Out to Get Me. They also played Redefined by Incubus, Milk by Jimmy's Chicken Shack, What's Up People by Maximum the Hormone, Time by the Deli Creeps, 
Fight for Your Right to Party by the Beastie Boys, Too Many Puppies by Primus, and a sweet extra piratey version of Coattails of a Dead Man by Primus also. The band all wore pirate hats for that song and they threw a bunch into the crowd. They also played a number of clutch songs, Soap Makers, Earth Rocker, and Space Grass. They played a few slower songs for fun throughout the night. Edge of the World by Faith No More, Dope Show by Marilyn Manson, Been Caught Stealing by Jane's Addiction, and Fat by Weird Al Yankovic. Axel even put on a makeshift fat suit for Fat. It only made him have a beer belly, but he shook and bounced his beer belly off everyone and everything during that song. The theme of their massive set list was definitely rebellion based. But they also seem to like to have fun. Taking yourself too seriously is the rabbit hole you go down when you want to stop having fun. These monkeys and apes, they were still having fun. And in a rare pre-song talk, Axel said to the crowd, I hope this next song comes true in some way. He pointed up, last song. The whole arena went ape shit. They must have known what the last song was going to be. King looked down at the humans. This, this is the tribe's favorite song. And then the band unleashed an extended rocking version of Clutch's Escape from the Prison Planet. It is a song about escaping a prison planet. It meant a lot to all these apes and monkeys who were essentially living on a prison planet. During the chorus of, Get out! Eject! Axel didn't even sing. He just held out his mic, and the entire arena sang it for him. They obviously also liked the second chorus, when they all got to sing, Escape from the Planet of the Apes! They brought the house down in a big, epic finale. Dot, dot, dot. Not too far away, inside the cockpit of an Elosa war store, Mosh Tree is on the main screen, numbers changing and scrolling by in little windows on the edges of the screen. A whoosh sound can be heard. Everyone in the cockpit snaps to attention. Then comes the clicking of the captain's shoes and his guards. That's where they are, the captain asked. That's what Clone 40269 reported, a supervisor reported. Send out mm, two pairs of tall and short. Have them kill any survivors who try to escape, the captain ordered. In another part of the war store, far from the cockpit, the IG-88 Terminator-like eyes of tall and short the robots lit up. Hooks unlatched. A door grinded open. And they took off. Shortly after, another two pairs of eyes lit up and and another pair of tall and short took off into the night behind them. Well, the captain asked. Two pairs of tall and short have been deployed, a non-supervisor replied. The captain looked over at his guards, twisted his mouth, and pointed at the and pointed at the non-supervisor who had just talked out of line. Both guards rushed over, grabbed him, and began dragging him out of the cockpit, kicking and screaming. This time slower and longer, the captain asked. Well The supervisor touched the shoulder of a crew member in front of him who moved a few windows on his screen. The war store sat in an open field in the quiet night. It was about a quarter mile away from Mosh Tree. Four sets of red eyes scurried along the ground between the war store and Mosh Tree. Suddenly, the war store's machine guns lit up the night with rapid fire. The war store had had four sets of front-facing machine guns and they ripped into Mosh Tree. It was the end of the last song. 
The crowd was giving a standing ovation. They were going crazy in Mosh Tree. Axel was holding up the mic, pointing to the crowd. They all began seeing little scattered dots. And the dots became little pops. Pop, pop, pop. A monkey from the ceiling dropped, limp. A lot of people started looking around. The mic got knocked out of Axel's hand. He looked left and right like, what the fuck? Then his face got ripped apart as a wave of bullets crossed his head. One second, Axel was on top of the world. The next second, his face looked like a red abstract painting. His body fell backwards, instantly dead. Mosh Tree panicked.